Welcome to Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here is the podcast host, James Delling Pool. Welcome to the Delling Pool podcast with me, James Delling Pool, and a guest that you've all been hungering for. Absolutely like ravenous wolves, you've been demanding his blood or his appearance on the podcast. It is back again, Jacob rees Jacob, welcome. Well, thank you very much for having me back. I'm honoured to be given a return um, appearance. No, no, it, actually, it is given to few. It is given to few. Um, but I, I reckon, you know, even if you came back a third, fourth or fifth time, people would not lose their appetite for you. Um, now, I've got some... I, to start off with, I've got various questions which have been given to me by my, my Twitter followers. Um, some of them are frivolous and some of them are serious. So let's deal with the serious ones first. And some are um, seriously frivolous. Yeah, indeed. Or frivolously serious. Serious ones first. Um, where do you get your hair cut? Oh, well, um, I always used to go to um, uh, um, those people at the bottom end of St. James's Street, Truefit and Hill, who right. are the most um, long-standing barber's shop in London. But then they um, made all their long-standing hair cutters uh, become contractors and the chap who'd always cut my hair didn't want to do this so he actually comes around to me privately and cuts my hair but I thought true fit he'd worked for them for over 30 years and I thought they treated him rather poorly in bringing his contract to an end and expecting him to take different terms um, so he kindly comes around and uh, does me and my children at home. That is exactly the kind of answer I would have hoped for. Um, second question um, where, who is your tailor? Ah, oh, who is my tailor? The, you, the answer to this is obvious, it's my father's tailor. I mean, who else would one possibly go to? Right, well, my, my, my father's tailor was in Birmingham, I don't, I, so, so I, I didn't go to that one. Did you not? Did you not go, well, go, go there, to Birmingham in homage? There was no, there was no, I, it might not even exist now, actually. I, I do have some of my father's old suits by, by a company called Hackett and Yearsley. Um, maybe they'll contact me if they do do still do exist. Still, yes. But but the, I never had a, a moment. You know, the, the moment where your father takes you to Paris to uh, relieve you of your virginity with a with a with a madame. That never happened. Right. To my me. father never took me no. to Paris. No. But that isn't that that wasn't that the old way. I wonder. I, I think that would have been a rather rakish element of society that right, behaved okay. like that. Um, and nor did he take me to get my. So so who, who was the Did you did you say? Oh, is um, Henry Poole. Right. Um, who are, I Um, think, also the oldest established tailor in London. Is that right? I I like going to firms that um, have a long lineage, though Henry Paul would probably be frightfully embarrassed that I've made public that they um, clothe me. Do you think you've ruined... No. Ruined their reputation. That's not true. I think think you are starting a a one-man, double-breasted suit (laughs) revolution. (laughs) I reckon Generation Z are all going to be in double-breasted suits. Well, the things wax and wane, but yeah. I'm, I'm not sure it will have anything to do with me. Um, the final really serious question. Mm. Do you think the time will ever come, let me get this right, when a boy will be born who can swim faster than a shark? I don't know how fast sharks swim, but I would have thought it would be unlikely. Because sharks have a shape that helps them to swim fast but i don't know i'm not an expert on these matters i am a semi-expert and i can tell i can concur with your argument because actually i went to south africa to dive in a cage with great white sharks Mm. and what really stunned me was just how quickly the great white sharks appear out of nowhere and they were swimming against the current and one minute they're not there and Mm. suddenly right beside you is this well, actually not that scary, but it should be scary, shape with its kind of distinctive white belly and its dark on top mm. and the eye, the black eye looking at you just out of nowhere. It was amazing. Yes. So I think I, you're right. There will never come a time. I would have thought it would be unlikely yeah. un- unless the boy had um, a, a sort of jet pack on to give him a little bit of extra speed. I, yeah. mean, I would have thought naturally it would be highly unlikely. Yeah, exactly. Good. So so, so we've put that one to, to rest. Um now, I have to say, the vast majority of questions from the Twitter sphere were, were conveyed to me in a tone of disappointment. Mm-hmm. The people want you as their leader. They want you to be prime minister, and, and, and you have rejected the people's wishes. <laughs> um, that's very flattering. 
Uh, I think we've got to sort out Brexit, and I think that uh, the individual is not the important thing. I think the big overall picture is what matters, and delivering on this key policy, which the nation's future will depend upon. And it needs to be done properly. It mustn't be the sort of half-baked Brexit that was coming out of checkers. No. Well, we agree on that. But but when you say that it's not about individuals, it's about the, the broader policy, everyone knows, and even you, even you know in your, in your heart, um, that the problem is shaped like Theresa May. And everyone is saying, I mean, everyone, well, apart from the one who asked the shark question, he wasn't asking it, but everyone else was. Or the one who asked about my tailor, or the one who asked about the barber, but never mind. Apart from those, those. what everyone is saying is, look, we are so disappointed in Jacob. He he showed such promise, but it looks like he's going to let this grisly woman, my words, not yours, um, get away with murder and, and frustrate the wishes of 17.4 million people. I mean, how are you going to stop it? Um, well, people like me will vote against the um, proposals when they come through in legislative form, that there has to be the meaningful vote. The meaningful vote's pretty meaningless as it happens, uh, but the legislation is very important. Any deal that the government does has to get through parliamentary processes to be in legislation by the 29th of March next year, otherwise we leave without any uh, further arrangement, um, what you might call a clean um, Brexit. And therefore there is a challenge for the government to come forward with proposals that people will be willing to vote for. And at the moment it doesn't look as if they will do that. And that is when uh, votes will happen. Legislation will be... um, difficult to get through. Now, I don't know how the Labour Party will vote, but if the Labour Party doesn't back the government, then it will not be able to get the sort of Brexit that your listeners don't like through Parliament. Right. That's when it matters. And there's no point in firing off um, against anything and everything. Uh, it's important to wait for what actually matters and has substance. Yeah. I think that's what those of us who are MOG fans... By the way, let me say another of the questions from somebody called Pete North. Have you ever come across Pete North? Mm. Pete North, his, his, his question was, um, how can Jacob ask, possibly answer any of your questions when you've got your tongue so far up his ass? What not that a rude question? Well, I, I think Mr North should wash out his mouth with carbolic soap. <laughs> exactly, yes. But this is what we fans of yours are rather hoping, that, that you have got a cunning plan, and that the cunning plan is... To bide, to to um, save your ammo until you can see the whites of their eyes. It's not a cunning plan at all. It's the most obvious plan in the world. That the European discussion is going on. There is negotiation in process. There are lots of leaks and rumours and stories that come out. It's very easy to get wound up about an individual story that comes through, which then turns out to be untrue. Yeah. And the danger of getting wound up about each individual story is that you make a great song and dance about how you don't want this and you don't want that. And the government comes along and says, that's fine, we're not doing that. Don't worry, it's all absolutely fine. And then in the detail you discover they're doing something much worse. But you've used all your credibility up in opposing something that was never going to happen in the first place. Mm. And then you've got none left with which to oppose what really matters. So we have to wait and see what comes out of the negotiations. And then, look, it may be brilliant. It may be a super Canada idea. It may be an approach to Brexit that we can all get behind. And then that's terrific. Or it may not be. But once we know, we can make uh, intelligent and coherent criticisms and we can work out what the parliamentary numbers are. Isn't there a a danger that if Labour are really cunning, they could vote with whatever shoddy deal that um, Theresa May and um, her civil servants managed to concoct, in which case aren't we in serious trouble? Yes, we are. Um, in two ways. One is that we would get a bad Brexit and the other is that we would split the Tory party in two. And the lesson here is 1846 uh, is the repeal of the Corn Laws when Peel gets his policy through um, with a backing of the Whigs and with the Tory vote more voting against him than for him. He then loses on a coercion of Ireland bill when the Tories vote against him because they're simply cross with him, they're fed up with the way he's behaved and they feel that he has betrayed his manifesto commitments. I think that is the sort of thing that would happen if the government got a bad Brexit through 
on the back of Labour votes. If it's a Labour Brexit rather than a Conservative Brexit, then Conservative MPs will be unforgiving. So are we just reliant essentially on Labour not being clever enough to do that that terrible thing? Well, Labour may be even cleverer. It may have come to the conclusion that the best way to damage the government is to ensure that it loses and then hope that that leads to a general election. And I think that's what some of the pro-Europeans within Parliament are thinking. They're thinking the government loses, the um, House of Commons as a whole is very nervous about a clean Brexit. It wants some sort of shoddy deal. Therefore, it might force the government out. Then you get a Labour government and you get to stop Brexit altogether. That's, that's the alternative cunning plan from the opposition side. Right. So, so if, if Labour vote with the government, it's bad. But if Labour vote against the government, it's also bad. It does sound like... A... Uh, I don't think the second process works. Right. I, I mean, I think if Labour votes against the government and the government loses, yeah. then the government, by virtue of being in control of the parliamentary timetable, can deliver a clean Brexit on the 29th of March mm. uh, without needing to have any further parliamentary votes. And therefore, it doesn't. the government doesn't fall, it carries on, but it needs um, good leadership at that point. It, ne- it needs decisive and bold leadership to make that work. Just going back to, to Peel, um, when I was at the House, just uh, by the steps leading up to the buttery, mm. um, there's a somebody's shot, no peel. Oh, no peel, yes, the indeed, doorway. indeed. And it's a great relic. Um, and at the time, I didn't know really much about peel or the Corn Laws. But I think now I would have voted to repeal the Corn Laws, wouldn't, wouldn't you? But I think the no peel is over Catholic emancipation rather oh, than was the Corn it? Laws. I think it's earlier, and I, I have a feeling he... he he is at some point member of parliament for Oxford University. Right. Uh, and I think it is to do with his change of view. Because he was nicknamed Orange Peel. Right. Because he was so strongly against Catholic emancipation. And then he did a U-turn to favour Catholic emancipation, which upset Oxford, which was, at that point, uh, not a great bastion of pro popery. Oh, I see. I okay. think. Um, however, you're absolutely spot on. I would support the repeal of the Corn Laws. Um, and interestingly, I think what we're doing at the moment is the reverse, that, that leaving the European Union is repealing the Corn Laws. Trying to stop leaving the European Union is keeping protection. Because what the European Union does is it protects inefficient, incompetent companies rather than opening them up to competition and being on the side of the consumer. So the price of beef in London is twice the price of beef in New York. Why is that? It's because we're protecting Irish beef farmers who produce expensive beef, and we put 70% tariffs on beef coming in uh, from the rest of the world. And this is not in the interests of consumers. We put 10.2% tariff on cars. Why? Why don't we buy well-made Japanese cars at a lower price and have proper competition? Um, this is in the interests of consumers. We put tariffs on oranges. How many oranges do we grow in the United Kingdom? Other than a, a few inexpensive greenhouses, it's not a commercial activity. We put 30 odd percent tariffs on wine. Why are we discriminating against Australian wine uh, in favour of Bulgarian wine? Which is what Tim Tim Martin, the weather who is a is, great man, is he yes. not a fine man? He is. Yes, I've been on platforms with him on a number of occasions. He's I very saw impressive. you at the you, Birmingham you conference. Did indeed, yes. And you, that session. I mean, I I think you 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 kept going from all sorts of different sessions. Uh, and they were all really popular, much more popular than, I think, the um, the main events. Yes. I mean, we had the advantage that we had smaller rooms, and it's easier to fill a small room than a large room. I, I found my most popular events were in rooms that could only fit about five people, and then ten came, and it looked like a terrific yeah, success. Yeah, but uh, they were turning people away at the door. Yeah, yeah. Um, they were. No, it's, it, it was... There's a real appetite for a clean Brexit, and we need to to deliver that. But but your point on, on the Corn Laws, um, and was Peel right? Yes, he was. And that's because he was in favour of free trade and he was putting the consumer first. And that's what Brexit is about. Brexit is, in fact, Peelite. It is the anti-Brexit uh, that is Luddite. Yeah. Will you explain, explain briefly for our special listening friend um, who possibly lives in America or Australia or hasn't studied history, exactly what the Corn Laws that the repeal thereof was about. 
Yes, the, the Corn Laws was a system of protection for um, growing of uh, corn in the United Kingdom, it was that it led to a fall in the price of bread. And you had a major, therefore, the growth in the urban and industrialized population. And therefore, this was key to their standard of living, that food became cheaper. And what then happens is people have more disposable income to spend on other things. So it becomes very um, positive economically. But it's also good for agriculture because what happens is that it's worthwhile farmers investing and innovating to increase their productivity so that the costs domestically come down to compete with the global price. So in the end, everybody benefits, though there is uh, a period of um, adjustment and that can be difficult. And it, it, in looking at how we leave the European Union, it is important to remember those who will suffer from the adjustment and try and uh, ease the difficulties that they may face. Yeah, I wanted to go big on this analogy because I think it is important. It's about partly about vested interests, isn't it? The, the people who wanted to keep the Corn Laws were the landed class who'd, who'd held sway over Britain for centuries. And this was the transition from the landed class to the industrial class. That's absolutely right. It was a transition from um, landed wealth to industrial wealth. And uh, this changed things. So, so somebody pointed out to me last night, actually, and I don't know much about racing, so I hope this is correct, that uh, before the repeal of the Corn Laws, the 2,000 guineas had been won in every one of the previous 37 years by a major landowner. And in every one of the 37 years afterwards, it was run by a major industrialist. And that's a very interesting yeah. snapshot of the change in wealth. And industrialists brought a huge improvement in the standard of living to the bulk of the British people. Why? Because they were able to buy goods more cheaply and they were able to buy uh, goods that made their lives more comfortable. Now, this could simply be clothing that becomes... it. it, it in the 1840s, you're talking about the essentials of life. You're not talking about them buying a battery-powered car or something like that. You're talking about really making the um, essentials of life more comfortable and easier for people. And that's the growth of industrialization. Yeah. Um, yes, I want to come on to um, the caricature version of you and what people think you, you would have thought in, about the Corn Laws in the next section. You're listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole, and my very special, very exciting guest, Jacob Rees-Mogg. Breitbart News Daily with Alex Marlowe. Genie in Pennsylvania. I think he's gotten away from what we really hired him to do, which is draining the swamp. If you look at the real picture of draining a swamp, you go in and you take all the water out. What sure. does it leave? It leaves the gunk. He cannot mm. get rid of the gunk. We have to get rid of the gunk. Everything he's doing, he's lowering the water so we can see who needs to go. The only way they can go is if we vote them out. Breitbart News Daily. Weekdays at 6 a.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Patriot. 125. This is Delling Poll, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Delling Poll. Welcome back to the Delling Poll podcast with me, James Delling Poll, and my very special guest, Jacob Rees-Mogg. Jacob, you get a similar sort of grief to the grief I get, which is that people sometimes accuse me of being part of the establishment just because I went to, you know, a decent university and was privately educated and stuff um but you get it even more so i think a lot of a lot of the caricature version of you would have it that you are stuck in the 18th century that you are a kind of that you've got a, a big house in in somerset and therefore you would have been against against the people and for the for this establishment but you're not really i mean you're you're actually more of a radical or revolutionary um, well, I'm not surprised that people think you're a member of the establishment with your very conventional and consensus-orientated views. And I'm sure many of your listeners <laughs> th think that this is the um, case. Um, I've, absolutely, I do understand why people think that I am an archetype of the establishment. Yeah. Uh, I'm, where I was born into the establishment, my father was editing The Times when I was born, and there was hardly a more establishment post in those days. Although, we've... Parenthesis. Um, being being, uh, he's still a, he was still a journalist, which is not, yeah, which is not very high up in the scheme of things, is it? I I th think you're confusing the social establishment with the British establishment. Right. The, okay. the, 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 the Times 
was and is a sort of establishment yeah. pillar, if okay. you see what I mean. Um, and uh, um, so why, therefore, am I so anti-establishment? Mm. Well, I think having grown up with it, I know what's wrong with it. I think the problem with the British establishment, the governing establishment, is it's basically in the business of managing decline. And I don't think that's good enough. And I think Margaret Thatcher showed that you could do better than that and you could make reforms that made the country more prosperous. And what does that do? That improves the standard of living of everybody. And this way you need to learn from what the best politicians in the past have done. What they do is they focus on the individual, on individual standard of living and how policies affect people one by one and ensure that the policies allow people's standard of living to rise, and they concentrate on the individual, not on the collective. The establishment is very much interested in the collective rather than in the individual. What do you think about the argument that, that Durkin, Martin Durkin advanced in his um, film he made immediately after the death of Margaret Thatcher, where he said that she wasn't really a representative conservative, she was more of a, more of a, more of a radical? Well, I, I think these labels aren't necessarily very helpful, that she was the leader of the Conservative Party, uh, she believed in free markets, and the best Conservative leaders know what they want to conserve doesn't mean that they sit there doing nothing. The sort of idea that a true Conservative leader would just leave everything as it is, not do or change anything, but that's not really how the party has been most effectively led. If, if you look at the great Tory leaders, um, who are they? Well, they're Peel, they're Disraeli, uh, they're Margaret Thatcher, and then obviously in wartime, <coughs> arguably Pitt the Younger, depending on whether you really classify him as a Tory, which is a matter his biographer would have quibbled about, that he became seen as a Tory by the end of his life, uh, and Winston Churchill. Uh, and that these great figures see what they need to do and get on and do it, rather than just sitting back and allowing events to wash over them. The problem I have, and you have I'm sure, defending conservatism, or rather trying to, trying to red pill the younger generation into being conservatives, is that too often the Conservative Party, in recent years, certainly since Margaret Thatcher, has almost consistently done the wrong thing, that it has not acted in the interests of the people we talked about earlier but have propped up vested interests. We, we saw, for example, how it responded in the wake of, of 2008, of, of um, uh, the financial markets crashing. Um, instead, of, instead of saying, look, uh, we're, 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 we were partly responsible for this, they, they, they ended up sort of going along with Labour's plans. Oh, the, the um, policy followed by the Tory party after 2005 was basically Labour light. Yeah. And that left us in a very difficult position to criticise the Labour party when the financial crisis hit, because yeah. we hadn't made the intellectual case for doing things differently. We'd come to the conclusion that the electorate wasn't going to vote Conservative, so we'd pretend not to be. Mm. And that was a mistake. Uh, and you know, by the time of the 2010 election, we failed to win a majority, I think at least in part, because we hadn't made that intellectual case. And we got to the position of essentially arguing that we were slightly better managers than the other side. And I think ultimately this very managerial approach is not sufficient. I think people want to know that what you're doing is based on some form of principle and that you have a direction that you are going in. And it's very straightforward for the Conservatives. We basically believe that people should make decisions over their own lives. They should be as free as possible to do that that society is built from the bottom up, from individuals and their families, building a society, uh, a community, and that the job of politicians is to allow people to follow the path of life that they want and that we should um, clear the path, we should cut the hedges and that we should remove the um, stones that they may trip over. We should not tell them which of the many paths they ought to go down because we know best. That is socialism. You say we... But it seems to me there are lots of people in the cabinet right now who who wouldn't understand those views. Well, you must invite them onto your podcast. <laughs> yeah, but they just no. Look, the reason that I haven't, for example, had he, even even Gove, who is who is a friend of mine, mm. um, I've told him this. I said, look, all you all you do over the hour w would be to eloquently bat off all my my questions with with clever politicians answers and you would never have any you, you'd, you'd never get to the core of what you really believe 
Am I not giving you clever politicians' answers? No, Am no. I giving you stupid no, politicians' fact, answers? In, no, I'm, no, I'm I offended. Think, well, look, I mean, I maybe, know, maybe Pete North right. Um, I, I mean, I am a fan, but the reason, I, the reason I'm a fan is because you, I think you do do give a straight answer. Well, I try, I try to, and Michael would actually. I think you're harsh on Michael. I think you'd have a very interesting hour with him. Well, I love him. His, I mean, his 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 press office would probably have kittens at the thought of you doing a podcast with him. But I think he would be. Very, I think his nature is to be very open and forthcoming. Prob- I've only. I think um, maybe I'm wrong. I think I've only once listened to something you've said and thought he's playing the politician's game here, and that was when you talked about the NHS. Um, I mean, I know that we both know that the NHS is a kind of national religion, and it is a complete vote loser ever to diss it in any way but i think as our friends at the iea like like to point out what people are fetishizing is a a delivery system which is which is unfit for purpose they're not really saying things like we want patients to to have a a better deal from you know from medical care they're not talking about the, the, the people are ultimately who this is designed for. They're talking about the system. Mm. Do, you, do you not ever, ever think that you, you could be a bit bolder on this issue, given that nobody else is making the case for NHS reform? Well, I think there are two different things. I think one is NHS reform and one is the question of free of point of use. I think there is no mileage in British politics for changing the free of the point of use principle. It is something that people value. And um, actually, when you look at other health services around the world, it's probably as cost-effective as any of them. If you look at the US, it spends as much um, public money on health as it does private money. But the US but, is not the best example. I mean, okay, so what well, about Sing- is, Singapore? Uh, hold on, the US isn't a bad example because it has very, very high-quality health care. The best American health care is the best in the world. Hmm. So, it, it, you know, it, it has its problems, but it's not this health care system we should just write off and say it's, it's no good. It's not second-rate. It just has problems of access well, and is very expensive, very, very expensive, both publicly and privately. Yeah. And, and if you view the insurance premiums that you have to pay in the US, if you're in employment, effectively as a tax, it's not much different, you've got to have it, then people in the US paying more tax in aggregate for their health service than we are here. Yeah, sure. Okay, so you, you've cited America, but okay, what about um, Singapore? What about I mean, even even the Netherlands has a better healthcare? It, you know, it works better than than ours. I think I think there are lots of. But it costs more in the Netherlands. Okay, but there are lots of models but, but, which I think okay, would work but, better. I, I, I have no objection to looking at different models and to mm. looking at reforms. Yeah. But I think the principle that is very important is the free at the point of use. Right. Yeah. And I, I think that is something that um, there's no, there's no point in a politician coming up with a scheme that the British electorate simply wouldn't accept. That's certainly true, and I think that that some of my more red meat listeners don't quite sometimes quite get this. That I mean, I hate the idea that politics is the art of the possible because I don't think Bismarck was really one of us. Um, no, no, definitely not. <laughs> really, no, really not. <laughs> really not. No. Um, nevertheless, I think there is a point where you have to bite your tongue, and perhaps that national religion is one of them. Well, uh, uh, but. Then on the money issue, yeah. I didn't like the 350 million being put on the side of the famous bus. Yeah. But once it had been, that money had to be provided. I think when politicians promise something to voters, they should well do it. Right. And they can't get out of it by saying, oh, well, we weren't fighting a general election. We weren't in a position to make the promise. It's not up to us, governor. Yeah. Um, we did make the promise. And therefore, if the election went that way, which it did, Whoever was in government had to deliver on that because the British people had clearly voted, at least in part, for 350 million extra for the NHS a week. And I'm glad, therefore, the government's done it. Right. Well, the people because have... trust in politics is so important. And even if you make unwise promises, you ought to do your best to deliver on them. Yes. People are very, very nervous right now about what's going to happen next because there are, there are almost infinite possibilities, aren't there? I mean, you mentioned earlier about what if Labour votes with the, the government's um, Brexit policies and what if it work, votes against. We, no, no one knows anything right now. But what's your, what's your best guess at what's going to happen? I mean, because oh, I voted for Brexit in the hope that we would become a kind of freebooting, free trade, Singapore, 
type economy when everyone got richer. We were just like this, this mm. powerhouse. Britain could be great again. How likely do you think that is of happening? Well, this is up to the Great British Electorate in the end, yeah. that these issues become a matter of ordinary political discussion, which the country can now decide once again for itself. Yeah. Whereas in 2017, the election then, whilst we're still in the European Union, we can't decide these great matters. We can't decide the VAT rate on solar panels at the moment, because that's decided by the EU. So what I like is that your vision can be put to the voters, and the voters can say, we want the Delling Pole vision of a country. Or they can say, we want Corbyn vision of the country. Yep. And it's quite exciting. The difference is significant. But both sides can now implement what they're promising. This, I think, will help restore trust in politics, because politicians won't be able to say, oh, it's not my fault. It's all decided by those terrible people in Europe. I'd have loved to have done whatever it is, yeah. but I can't. And this makes politicians take responsibility. It holds their feet to the fire. It ought to make their promises more realistic. But it also means that you can try out, um, if he gets elected, Jeremy Corbyn's theories. Well, if the British people vote for that, the British people are entitled to have that happen. But Jeremy Corbyn, to be fair on Jeremy Corbyn, has made it clear what his policies are going to be. If, if, no, if he, he has wins. indeed. And, and John McCon... Uh, What's it called? McDonald. McDonald. Yeah. McDonald, yeah. Um, has he, he's you know it's it's going to be Venezuela Mark two and 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 they think this is good and a lot of, a lot of students think this is going to be splendid too because they've never experienced communism at first hand, but I don't really see the cons- the current Conservative Party in any form outlining this wonderful Delling Pole vision as you describe it. Oh, I think we are, um, but I'm not convinced that the leadership of the party is. Ah, yes. But aren't, aren't the leadership kind of keen in the matter? I mean, they're the ones who get the well, most TV time and the most newspaper time. Policy ideas emerge. We're a bottom-up party, not a top-down party, so the policy ideas come from the bottom-up. Ah, that's an interesting point you raised there. The Labour Party is, of course, a top-down party. It's collectivist. Yeah. But is it, is it not the case that the current structure of the Conservative Party means that the grassroots have been shut out of the the debate? Um, the grassroots have less of an influence in the debate than they used to. The old CPC is being reinvigorated and um, members are debating issues and sending their reports in again, which has restarted and is being taken quite seriously. Uh, but the decline in membership of the Conservative Party uh, has gone uh, hand in hand with the decline in interest in members' views. And I think we want to go back to a situation where you have proper debates at the party conference uh, on motions sent in by local associations that discuss the issues that party members want to discuss rather than uh, issues um, or or being used as a grand uh, convention to um, go rah-rah for um, the official line. Yeah, well, with you on that. But is it not the case that the reason we're in such a frightful pickle at the moment is because we could never possibly get, um, well, you as Prime Minister, even if you wanted to be a you know, party leader, we could, even though I think there's an appetite appetite for the morgue. Um, and, and the same goes with, with Boris. But there is this problem. There's, there, there is this, the people, the Conservative Party, the, the base might want Boris, but the level above the, 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 uh, what, the, the parliamentary party mm. has currently been so stuffed in the Cameron era, I think, with these kind of squishy, sort of not real conservative Sarah Wollaston types, that they're going to frustrate what, what the actual people want. I think you're unfair. I think the Tory party is a broad church in the country at large, and that Sarah is as good a conservative as I am. She um, believes in high taxes, apparently. Um, she is in the broad family of the Conservative Party. Well, that's worrying. Uh, and that's important. No, all political parties are coalitions. They're not, nor would we want the Conservative Party to be. I mean, this would be a very unconservative thing to want, for the Conservative Party to be a pure ideological sect. No, it would be great. It would be no, it would be, ter- it would be terrible, and we would never win an election, and we'd never get anything done. Right. And we would allow the opposition to Why make Why would we hay. not get things done? Surely we would we get would be- lots done, because we'd, we'd, if we had a universal agreement on, with, the, with a party of low taxes. We, 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 if we became a narrow ideological sect, we wouldn't win. 
We've mm. got to hold the coalition of the Conservative Party together and persuade it, as Margaret Thatcher did so successfully, and Nigel Lawson, who ought to be a great hero of your many listeners, uh, did, was to persuade the bulk of the party that we were doing the right thing and to persuade the country we were doing the right thing. But you need that broad church to, to start with. Um, and is, is that what um, the current Prime Minister thinks? Uh, no. I think the current Prime Minister is in the model as David Cameron was, of a highly competent manager rather than of somebody who has a, a clear idea of the underlying conservative principles that she wants to follow. Yes, exactly. Um, so um, I've lost a few friends over, over Brexit. Uh, has, have you had that experience as well? Have you, have you been ostracised at all by certain elements within, the, within your social... No, I haven't. I haven't lost any friends over Brexit. Um, because they were all sound in the first place. No, not at all. I've got lots of friends who are not the least bit sound on no. Brexit. Um, but they've always known my view. They're your friends. Must always have known your view. It can't have come yeah. a great surprise to them. Um, uh, there are some people who find me very irritating because of my views on Brexit, but they tended not to be friends in the first place. Right. Okay. They probably found me irritating for all sorts of other reasons as well. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you do. A l- that's, that's, that's one of the joys of you. you. You annoy all the right people. It's one of the pleasures of life, is annoying po-faced leftists, but I probably shouldn't say that. <laughs> well, you've just said it. Um, you're listening to the Delling Pod podcast with me, James Delling Pod, and my very special guest, Jacob rees Mogg. Breitbart News Tonight with Joel Pollack and Rebecca Mansour. A lot of people not knowing what action they could or should take to make the difference. What I do is try to turn people on to sites like Breitbart, you know, people who are writing and publishing the truth so that people will get educated but you know you kind of can't blame productive members of society who are kind of confused perplexed as to what do we do to take this government back Sirius XM Patriot Channel 125 This is Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast Here once again is James Delling Pool. Welcome back to the Delling Pool podcast with me James Delling Pool, and my very special guest Jacob Rees-Mogg. Before we go on to the other things I wanted to ask you about, about Trump and Bolsonaro, I'm going to spring that one on you. Um, I wanted to talk about a mutual friend of ours, William Sitwell. He's just lost his job for upsetting a vegan. Um, uh, yes, uh, vegans uh, turn out to be rather more red-blooded um, than perhaps one might have thought in the way uh, they've attacked William. I mean, I'm very biased. William is a very old friend. We were at school together, and he is godfather to my only girl, and I am godfather to uh, his girl, too. So I know him well and think very highly of him. He's a very able writer um, and a very successful editor, uh, a really, really successful editor. I mean, frankly, supermarket magazines are not really of any interest to anybody but he managed to make Waitrose magazine something that was interesting and got coverage regularly in the national papers. That's quite an achievement for um, the type of magazine that it is and the equivalents, which nobody's heard of. Nobody's heard of that. Imagine Sainsbury's and Tesco do their magazine. Asda magazine. Where is that? It has to be good. Um, and, uh, but oh, uh, my, my, uh, and, and so he'd, he'd been, been very successful at his at his role. Now he admits that he made a terrible joke. I mean, it suffered from not being funny, which is a prerequisite of jokes. jokes yeah. um, uh, but the reaction seems really extreme. Um, uh, uh, that uh, vegans are entitled not to eat meat if they don't want to, as long as they don't tell me that I have to eat lettuce leaves. I want to stick to eating meat, and I find it deeply tiresome that we're being told that um, eating meat is ruining the planet. I think there has to be some limit on environmentalism, and uh, uh, having my roast beef on a Sunday is, um, and as many other days of the week as possible. That's your line in the sand. <laughs> well, I, 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 mean, I think it's ridiculous. Um, uh, and I enjoy meat. And so the sort of campaigning um, approach that some people take against meat, I think, is... Uh, absurd and um, should not be uh, accepted as a, something we should just be allowed to be pushed over for. But I don't think you should be rude to vegans. I mean, I, I, I don't think you should 
offend them. I don't usually offend vegetarians. They are entitled to live their lives as they want in peace and quiet. But that doesn't mean you have to follow them or wish to change your own diet. Yeah. Or not mob them up a bit, but they can mob us up in return. I, I, William's joke wasn't funny. Mm. That is absolutely true and was a problem with it. Um, but I think if you go too far, you can't make a joke about anything. Yeah. I think, I think probably reading, reading what he said, it was probably a, a slightly testy brush off to a freelancer who he felt he felt was probably being a bit a bit pushy. I mean, I read I read her, I read her, the, the tone of it was was like, here I am, a young person telling you what you should be, you should be running in your magazine, and it's a great idea, and you should run it. And I, if I'd been an editor, and it, it caught me on an off day, I think I might have been similarly, you know, rude. But I've been following the debate on social media, mm. and it seems to be divided between people of our generation who think it's outrageous that a very successful, popular editor of 20 years should be ditched at the drop of a hat by, by, uh, by Waitrose. And the sort of younger people who think, well, he should, have, he should have watched his language. It's quite right that he lost his job for, for a private email for being rude to somebody. I, I, I look, I don't really buy the private email line. Okay. Um, that... Uh, somebody was asking to write for his magazine. Mm. That that seems to me part of the job of an editor. It's not some friend saying over dinner, oh, I've got a frightfully good idea for a series of articles. Right. Um, so I, I think just because something's on somebody's private email doesn't necessarily make, make it okay. private. But, but the bigger issue? The, the bigger issue... Um, well, Waitrose is a very snowflake organisation, isn't it? Mm. That that's its whole ethos is snowflakery. So I wouldn't be surprised about um, Waitrose. I, I imagine a more down-to-earth Aldi approach uh, would not have led to this happening. I wonder. I wonder if, if this had been Lidl or Aldi, as you say. Um, yeah. Well, they don't have a magazine because they're Germans anyway. I don't think they... Well, they don't have a magazine because um, they keep costs down and yes. they don't do things that yeah. cost them money. Um, so, okay, a- another way. But, but Waitrose is, a, um, is an effete company, isn't it? Yeah. Of all the companies that were likely to uh, be um, hair trigger on its PC-ness, right. it was going to be Waitrose. Okay, suppo- but suppose, <laughs> suppose Somerset Capital went tits up and you and you you lost your job as a as a as an mp and suddenly a lifeline was thrown to you by by waitrose and you found yourself being ceo of waitrose do you think knowing the company's brand you would have taken the same snowflake line and would you would you have held firm stood up for principle well i think from a political angle yeah one knows that these storms blow over very, very quickly. And I think this is a mistake that companies often make because they're not used to um, seeing events like this occur. In politics, there is a storm about something somebody said most days of the week. And six months later, you can't remember who said it, what it was about, why it happened. And a lot of... Um, political resignations, which usually take slightly longer than William's resignation, six months later turn out to be completely unnecessary. So I'm not saying that politicians get this perfectly right, but at least they know the brief lifespan of these stories in in theory. And I imagine uh, Waitrose just didn't and um, um, uh, panicked, thought that uh, a few thousand tweets meant something was being taken seriously and that it would damage their brand. Well, Nothing damages brands if their service is any good. Um, now, I may be proved wrong with the sales um, of Topshop, but I doubt I will be, that people go into shops because it's good value, it's good quality, and the shop is convenient. Or well, they do it online because it's even more convenient, even better value, and the delivery saves them going to the shops. Um, it's all about, does the company provide what I want? Not... Do I like the person running the company? You said some very important things on this podcast, but I, I would say that is actually the most important and interesting thing at, at the moment. The the culture wars that are being fought against, but the, 
the accepted values of, of, of our culture and, and Western civilization are being violated by this aggressive new generation of people who... I, my problem is less with the SJWs, the social justice warriors. It's with the corporations for caving. So how do we how do we restore some backbone to our institutions? Because everyone's at it. Look at the, look at the army. Look at the army with its embarrassing recruitment ads. Look at um, well, the, the, there are there are countless examples. Uh, how do we stop this happening? I'm pretty sure it's um, Edmund Burke, but it may be Dr. Johnson. I think it's Burke who made the comment uh, about the crickets in the field rather than the um, cattle standing by, and that people confuse the noise with the crickets with the uh, calm sedateness of the oxen. Um, and I think this is an important point, that Twitter seems to me to be the crickets in the field. They make an awful lot of noise, but it is a very, very little substance. Yeah. And how do we tackle it? Well, I think it tackles itself, because people realise that it isn't fundamentally important. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change the world. I think there should be a calmness in response to these storms, yeah, but you're describing an ideal. We we know, and I think most most of the people in the in the real world know. But you have HR departments, particularly in, in in corporations, they are they are prone to panicking. And I think that the needle has gone too far in that direction. And I wonder when the, when the backlash is going to happen because every day I think this has gone this is this madness has gone far enough. And every day you get a new example of even greater madness. Um. I mean, I think things change because you have a reaction and a counter um, reaction. Um, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. I seem to remember learning doing O level physics rather a long time ago, uh, and that that happens in public life as well. Yeah. And some of what you've seen is a reaction to bad behaviour previously for which nobody was held to account. And that's quite natural, and I don't think we would want to go back to an era where routinely bad behaviour was just allowed and nobody complained about it. But equally, there is the risk of going too far and being too sensitive, and I share your concern that we're becoming too sensitive over things that, in the grand scheme of things, are not important. We've got to talk about Trump, because I think you are pretty much the only only Conservative, well, certainly not Labour, politician, who's, who's spoken out in favour of him. Which, which, which astonishes me, because he's doing so much good. Well, his tax cuts have been tremendously successful uh, and um, helped the US economy and um, have brought a rational corporation tax system into the United States. And the first thing that happened when he made the tax cuts was that companies were able to repatriate money and give some of it to their employees. So it was a real boost uh, to um, US consumers and workers. Yeah. And that should be really positive. And... and I mean, Trump, Donald Trump, the President of the United States, phrases himself in a way that I would not choose to phrase myself. No. Um, and that is partly because US politics is very different from UK politics. And how do, how do you appeal? How do you put your majority together? But when you look at what he's actually done, um, his record is impressive. His, his record is better than Barack Obama's uh, record, without any question. So you've said it. And... The, the 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 skies didn't didn't fall in. Um, nobody died, and yet, very few other conservatives M- MPs, if any, have would dare say that. Well, I I, I think even my moderate um, defences of Donald Trump have probably been um, the most unpopular things that I have said. Is that I, right? I, I, there's not a there's not a great appetite for people saying popular things about or friendly things about Donald Trump. Uh, what underlies all that I say is that the most important foreign relationship for the United Kingdom is with the United States. It is a relationship that is special for us, but for them they've got lots of special relationships, and therefore it is not in our national interest to be gratuitously and routinely rude about the President of the United States. Yeah, but it, you you do have some material to work with. It's not like you're saying this stuff just in order to to um, enhance the special relationship. No, no, no. For, yeah, no, that's true. I mean, I, I think he has done some genuinely good and important things, uh, and it's fascinating the approach he takes uh, and how he gets things done by 
uh, being tough, by some extent overstating his case. But he brings the other side to the table, he gets negotiations going, he gets, he gets results. What do you think about, because you, you, you deal in emerging markets, is, is Brazil one of your areas or not? Y- yes, it is. Is it? Because, can I ask you a, 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 an investment question? Um, I saw the Bolsonaro visit, uh, a victory yeah. coming. Mm-hmm. I wanted to, to play some kind of bet whereby I would have benefited from, from, from that because I think it's going to be really good for the Brazilian economy. But I didn't know what to do. What, I, I didn't do anything in the end. What should I have done had I wanted to bet on it? It's very difficult to make investment decisions on the basis of election results. Oh, is it? Um, because how markets will react to elections is unpredictable. Right. Uh, that it may not be, you may get somebody right-wing elected, but the Wall Street culture may be quite left-wing and therefore they are more nervous than they are enthused and so you don't necessarily get the result in the market you expect. Um, You're probably better off going to spread betting places and doing something with them, sort of straightforward Bolsonaro to win. Hunting, yeah. Yeah. Rather than than being sure of how things will go uh, stock market-wise. Also, markets discount very early on because they look at the opinion polls just as right. well as anybody else does. And therefore, if there is a particular move, it's likely to be made beforehand rather than after. It's only if markets um, get an unexpected result. Uh, but look at the election of, of Donald Trump. The immediate reaction of the markets was nervous, and then they did very well yeah. um, uh, because people were frightened about Trump and didn't expect his result. Um, even though he was the more right-wing option. Yes. The markets don't necessarily like free markets. They don't, do they? I, I'm, I'm puzzled by this, because one would imagine that people making so much more than, than the average, average earner, um, that they would be natural conservatives because they want to keep their money rather than giving it to the government because they must know how governments mis, misuse money. And yet it seems to me that both Wall Street and certainly the city they're, they're, as represented, for example, by the Financial Times, they're very um, left liberal, really. They're, they're, they're very sort of Davos, Davos man. Davos man. I don't think the FT really represents anybody right. other than the FT. I think in, in, in the city, um, people like the status quo because they've got rich on the status quo. Right. And if anything that challenges it makes them quite nervous. Um, and it's fascinating that in the, in the city... By and large, well-established incumbent firms uh, have been anti-Brexit. Yes. And entrepreneurial firms have been much more sympathetic to Brexit. Um, compliance departments have been anti-Brexit. The traders have all been pro-Brexit. Right. And this, they're, this, the ops. They're, the, they're the people. Well, they understand how markets yeah. work. And they see the difficulties that the EU has brought in. Whereas if you're in compliance, that's made your job. Yeah. You know, to a senior pay shoot up because the shortage of good compliance officers. So... It's it's fascinating the, the the dynamic within within the city, but Brazil has been badly governed from the left for a long time yeah. and completely crookedly. The the fraud, the um, corruption in Brazil is hundreds of millions of pounds that that people have taken out of the system and taken out of the pockets of the least well off in society. It has been disastrous. It would be hard to imagine it'd be possible to run worse. And if you can clean up corruption, that's the real key. It would be extraordinary. I, I worry about, I worry for Bolsonaro, I think, because I've, I've been in contact with various Brazilians who tell me, like, we can't believe our life. This is extraordinary. At last, mm. there's hope for our country. But all you, all you read, in even, even the conservative media, I mean, the, the Daily Telegraph, for example, which used to be a conservative newspaper, it's, it's Stringer's report from, from Sao Paulo or somewhere. Uh, on the election result was Brazil braced for riots after election of far right president. That was the Telegraph's take. He's not getting a fair hearing in the in the, in the same way that Trump is not getting a, a fair hearing. What do you think is, is well? I, I, I don't I, I don't know. And there are things that he said in the past that raise serious questions. And there must be concerns about the democratic stability uh, of Brazil. So. I, I wouldn't want to get too enthusiastic. I would focus on the possibility of um, his being able to deal with the corruption question. Well, yeah. Because that's what's really been holding Brazil back. 
So do you think, I mean, have, what have the Brazilian markets been doing? I obviously haven't been following it, but you, but you presumably have. Well, I'm, I'm no longer running the investments here right. on, a, on, a, on a day-to-day basis. Um, uh, but the markets, all markets, have been very volatile recently. Um, October has been a pretty difficult month. Yeah, it has been. They've, they've, they've been sort of crashing, haven't they? But Brazil is, what, the world's ninth, Something like that. It, it, it's a very, it doesn't matter. It's a very important economy, a very large population. Um, and yes, uh, if it is having... It, it so depends on where the reforms go. But there have been a lot of false dawns in Brazil of people who were coming in. Everyone thought Lula was going to stamp out corruption and oh, right. improve it. Um, but Lula, Lula was a virtual communist, wasn't he? He was in his youth, yes. Yeah, and I think still well, pretty I, much I, in, his, in his policies... Um, that, okay, so you're not going to you're not going to go well, hey, Bolsonaro No, I'm, I'm yet. not. I'm not. I think it's much too early to, to say. But I'm equally not going to say this is an absolute disaster. Yeah, I think it's too early to know. Right. So before we go, I think can you offer us any crumbs of, of hope? Because people are very very worried about what's going to happen in the next months and years. They're fearful of a. What would you, for example, if you were pricing in a a, a Corbyn, a, a Corbyn reign of terror, what what percentage likelihood would you give that? It all depends. If we fail to live at Brexit properly, yeah. then Corbyn becomes more likely. Seventy percent of Tory voters back Brexit. Yeah. And so if we fail and deliver a checkered style Brexit, a non-Brexit Brexit, that increases the chance of Corbyn. What I think is going to happen is that we are sort of by accident going to get to a clean Brexit, not because the government particularly wants it, but because it can't get agreement for anything else. And that's very exciting. I, I would rather have an agreed Brexit and a Canada-style deal and free trade and yeah. all of that. But that if we don't, and we have to do it from our, for ourselves, we're on the 29th of March next year, that's a great opportunity. When you say so clean Brexit, you mean WTO That's terms. right, that's right, that's right. And uh, that is looking increasingly likely. That is looking increasingly likely unless the government comes up with a very impressive deal in the next few weeks, which I wouldn't hold my breath for. Right, right. So we can reassure our special listening friend that the reason that you've been so consistently polite about the Prime Minister, despite expressing reservations about her policies, is not because you are a lily-livered cuck, but in fact because you do know what you're doing, you, you do have a real plan. A man, a plan, a canal, Panama, mm. um, uh, if you like, palindromes. Um, I think you have to wait and see what is happening before you oppose things that are not happening. And that is the key to uh, parliamentary votes. <coughs> there will be votes, and then we will have to decide whether we go along with the government or we vote against the government. Yeah, that sounds to me like you do know what you're doing. Um, but, but obviously if Pete North is listening, which he's not... He'll, he'll come up with some very rude phrase for me with agreeing with you too much. No, no, he won't. He'll be too busy washing his mouth out with carbolic soap. <laughs> no. uh, you're listening to the Daily Pop podcast with me, James Daily Pop, and my very special guest, Jacob B. Smog. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Sonny's Corner with Sonny Johnson. I want to actually take a couple of the references to Donald Trump from hip-hop, and then we're going to try to see if we can figure out why they like Donald Trump. Jay-Z said, I'm at the Trump International. Ask for me. Raekwon said, I'm the black Trump. They are comparing themselves to what he represents, his wealth, his achievement, capitalism. Sonny's Corner with Sonny Johnson. Saturday from 1 to 3 p.m. East on Sirius XM Patreon. 125.